are now tuned in to the Storm Tracker Podcast. Storm Tracker Podcast here. Marcus Benjamin here with my guy, Frank Tucker, representing for CanesCounty.com, part of the Rivals Network. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and, of course, the website. Again, canescounty.com. And the inevitable finally happened, Frank. Josh Gaddis, offensive coordinator, officially out at Miami. This is something that we kind of hinted about on our message boards for a while now. I think uh, everybody on the inside kind of knew this was going to happen, and it finally did. Uh, most were thinking that Cristobal would wait until Gaddis secured a job elsewhere uh but he didn't wait uh friday uh what is it january 27th here he is officially let go uh first thoughts when you saw the press release uh come out for miami frank thought it was short <laughs> it, was, it was short press release Pretty um abrupt. yeah <laughs> yeah so you and i have kind of talked about this he, mario doesn't really fire people right it, it's just kind of been something where he just kind of Let's people make that decision, you know, by being just, you know, uncomfortable in a lot of different ways. Uh, but he, he makes this decision with interesting timing, right? He gets back into South Florida with coach Kevin Steele today, um, you know, and, and from a recruiting, you know, they were into like seven, eight different states recruiting kids via helicopter, right? And playing, but he comes back and immediately lets them go. And that's interesting to me because I, everything that we had heard was Gaddis was searching for another position and they were going to wait to let him find a spot so they could get out of that buyout, you know, and, and just kind of have that seamless transition to the next guy. Um, you know, I, and honestly, I think Josh Gaddis is, is a very good offensive mind. I think he's one of the best young offensive minds in college football. I just think this didn't mesh really well just from a communication standpoint. A lot of this, a lot of similar issues that happened at Michigan before they brought in a couple of guys from the Ravens happened at Miami, but there wasn't that time period where he got that multiple years to kind of redeem himself, right? It was first year was so bad that they had to make a move, right? Like yeah. we lose Jake Garcia because of dysfunction on the offensive staff, right? Not saying that, Jake Garcia was end all be all, but that's a perfect example of how bad things were going, right? It, we had talent in the receiver room. It just never panned out under Gaddis. And he's supposed to be the guy that's supposed to develop that talent. I think he did a good job of Colby Young, but there was just a lot of things that were missing with Gaddis that I think were fireable offenses. They were fireable offenses at the end of the day. It's unfortunate to see anybody lose their job. And it's the tough part of this business, but um, you know, Mario's Mario's looking to to make this a national championship level program, and sometimes you got to make tough decisions like this. Yeah, absolutely, and and it it does say a lot that he went ahead and just fired him and didn't wait uh, for him to get another job. I think it would hurt in recruiting if he kept him on the staff because, as we know, he wasn't tagged in a lot of these offers, uh, offensive offers that Miami. Uh, you know, sent out the kids, not on any recruiting uh, visits. So the writing was kind of already on the wall there. So Miami is really focused on recruiting and really kind of building talent here on the roster. And if you have someone who's not involved in that process, then it's the right move to let him go so you can begin that search uh, for your replacement so you can continue that momentum in recruiting so what's next though for for miami i mean first off josh, josh gaddis i think it was is a great guy um i got to know him pretty well and um uh, i do think he went into a bad situation he probably didn't realize the dysfunction in uh in the program or the lack of depth maybe wasn't really assessed as well as it could be because once the injury bug started to bite this team this team fell apart and uh that there was there was nothing that gaddis did 
to help uh, guide this team in, in in the right direction to at least get a get a a, a bowl appearance and and the offense. Let's just say say what it is, man. It was historically bad, historically bad. I mean, uh, you can see the, the the story on canescounty.com on on as far as how bad rankings wise in college football they were. And just based on those optics alone, I think you have to kind of uh, move on or you kind of understand why Miami and Cristobal decided to move on here. Uh, but where do they go now? You know, I think you have to have an offense that plays to TVD strengths because TVD is is going to be with us uh, for, for this next upcoming year. And we saw – him thrive in that Rhett Lashley offense, which was more of like a quick passing game, more of a spread out type of look, uh, less focus on the running game. Uh, but Cristobal likes the running game. He likes that power uh, type of uh, scheme. So which direction do you think my Miami should go? Should they continue to try to do this uh, power scheme? Because that's the route in which they seem to have recruited uh, to go in that direction? Or do you go with kind of a spread type of offense? I mean, listen, so here's one of the things that, you know, I've always wanted to kind of talk about with people is the spread offense doesn't mean more passing, right? The spread just means that you got a certain receiver look. It's typically four to five receivers, right? But that doesn't always mean that it's more passing, right? You can have a shot wing offense, right, that is based around the wing T scheme and have a bunch of receivers out there, right, that are just – there's a lot of motion into their run uh, run spot or run blocking spots, right, or, you know, it, it's still a run-based offense. I think that there's still going to be that philosophy of being able to pound the rock, being that power-based spread offense that Mario Cristobal wants to run. I think that the move that they're going to make going forward is the offensive coordinator is going to be coaching the quarterback position rather than the receiver yeah. position. That's the big transition I think is going to be made with the next coach, whether that's a James Coley, whether that's a Marcus Arroyo, whether that's somebody like that, it's going to be a guy that works directly with the quarterback and not another position. I think they would rather bring in a receiver's coach than bring in a quarterback's coach. Yeah. It's And that's going to be where the fix is going to be made. And I think that was where a lot of the disconnect was this year with Josh Gaddis. We've talked about this before. You don't even get into the first, you know, the first quarter of the year. He doesn't even really have a relationship with Tyler Van Dyke enough to where they're watching film extensively together. That was a Ponce and TVD thing. And I think that was a huge problem because we saw an uptick in TVD production as soon as they were able to get on a semblance of a page. And then TVD gets hurt. Then the offensive line falls apart. Then you're continuing to have issues at receiver. So it was just – it was Murphy's Law for the offense at, at Miami this year. What can go wrong will go wrong, and it did. Yeah. Uh, I think I think that they're going to bring someone in that wants to run the football. You got guys like Mark Fletcher. You got guys like Chris Johnson, right, that you you want to utilize. You want to utilize. You don't really got, you know, short shifty backs. It's more guys that – Trevante Citizen. You know, guys are going to be over 200 pounds, have the ability to run downhill. Then you just bring in – uh, an entire offensive line unit, basically, that fits what Mario Cristobal wants to do. Like you said, you got the next Penne Sewell, right, coming into the program at Francis Mawa Go. Samson Okamlola is 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 somebody that Mario Cristobal has talked about as the next Bryant McKinney in this program. That's a that's huge words, yeah. uh, huge words of uh, of praise, right? And, and they want to get back to this style of smash mouth football. The defense, I think, has the talent to be in place to help this team be a, a solid program, especially in the ACC where it, it's open. It's open to, for the taking at, at on a yearly basis, right? And I, I think that they're going to stick with, stick with that route. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, you make a good point about the quarterback's coach also being the offensive coordinator because right now, essentially, Miami has three vacant coaching positions open with the wide receivers coach because Josh Gaddis was also the wide receivers coach. And Frank Ponce 
also leaving the program. Now, there are some options at wide receivers coach as well um, that, you know, I, I've listed kind of toward the bottom of, of uh, my list on, on canescounty.com. Uh, and uh, that's going to be a key position to fill as well because – Let's be honest, um, the recruiting on the wide receiver position via the, you know, high school or transfer portal has has not really produced a lot of talent. Yeah, you got Ray Ray and Robbie, but these are hometown kids that always wanted to be Hurricanes. And you, you didn't really bring anybody from the transfer portal um, as far as receivers. So you need a guy who can recruit at least the state of Florida, something, somebody that is, is really proven. So uh, uh, like, like, uh, like a Kelsey Pope or maybe even a Taekwon Underwood, who knows um, someone who's familiar with South Florida and, re and recruiting South Florida at the wide receiver position will be key. The offense overall, Frank, to me, I think is going to be the same as, as last year. I, I think, I mean, I hate to be a Debbie Downer in this situation, but I don't I don't really see a lot of improvement with this offense as far as roster wise. I mean, yeah, most people think this offensive line is fixed. I don't I really don't think so with the departures of Ja'Kai Clark and, and John Campbell. Yeah, they were, you know, maybe average offensive linemen or maybe slightly above average, but uh, and they were bodies. Uh, they now you still have depth concerns on this offensive line, unless players like Matthew McCoy make a significant jump, or Logan Sagopalo make a sig significant jump, or um, Den uh, Jonathan Dennis makes a significant jump, or the the two freshmen play at an extremely high level. This offensive line hasn't improved that much so I, i'm still concerned with this offense overall you you have to have players that you've recruited in the last cycle really show up as big time players in order for this offense to really kind of make a step in the right direction so i don't want hurricanes fans to just automatically think okay well goddess gaddis is gone we got some new recruits in here and all of a sudden the offense is going to be on fire I think it's it's going to take some time for it to develop, and you're hoping for for players like Trevante Citizen to really pop and Jaleel Skinner to really kind of take that next step to really um, get to a high level where Hurricanes fans are happy. And one more thing is that I don't think Zion Nelson is is really going to be that effective. This guy's had three surgeries on his knee. He's been on crutches maybe eight or nine months uh, within the past year. It, it, if he does come back, it, it, he's not going to be at that level or or at that NFL draft level that we th we think he was or, or thought he could be. And um, also Arroyo, same thing, coming off an ACL uh, surgery. So it's 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 not as it's not as a uh, a great as of a as an upgrade from from last year as as people think with the players that they come in uh, i don't think this team gets any worse let's just say that but i don't think this is a, at this point i don't see this team getting to 9 10 wins let's just say that so i, I get the pessimism as a hurricane fan right as as someone who's who's watched this, you know, for for my entire life growing up in South Florida, but I, I'm on the flip side of your entire argument. I think that this offense, maybe not the best in the country type type thing, but we've seen Miami in the past with Rhett Lashley go from anemic on offense, Danny knows, right? Another former Alabama uh, coach that was supposed to come in and, and make a huge impact early, and transition into quality. Right, I'm just around 35 points a game. I think that the the pieces are in place for that to happen. Tyler Van Dyke, we we've seen him be a Heisman contender, quality quarterback. You have a quality backup in Jakari Brown, who, with another offseason of development at quarterback, 
could be good. This is college football, right? Hayden Hooker was an absolute nobody before he blew up this year for Tennessee. It is not outside the realm of possibility for a guy to make a huge jump from one year to the other. I think that they have three future NFL backs on the roster right now, which is way different than last year, right? And that doesn't include Henry Parrish. Like we, nobody's still talking about Henry Parrish, who was our leading rusher last year. You have four guys that can run the ball. And the running back position is a position where a kid who's a freshman, a true freshman, can make an impact right away just because it's one of those positions where it's not that much of a transition, right? And Mark Fletcher, we know how good Mark Fletcher is. We know the explosive skill set that Chris Johnson has. I, I think you got some worries at receiver just because you don't have a true alpha. But Colby Young could make another huge jump. Right, yeah. you you spoke about him extensively last year, uh, talking about him as a potential breakout candidate. He did just that. Yeah, coming into this year, he's going to be that major target in the red zone. Jacoby George, another year healthy, hopefully no suspensions in the beginning of the year. He could, <laughs> okay, he's going to yeah. be a guy that helps. Xavier Restrepo, we know what he can do. Right, Robbie and Ray Ray, maybe not crazy production as freshmen. But, again, explosive ability that brings speed to this offense that they didn't have before. And I think they've completely reconstructed this offensive line by bringing in seven, seven elite players, in my opinion. Three of those guys, um, on, you know, Tommy Kinsler, uh, Francis Mawagoa, and uh, Samson Okunlola, I think, could push for starting spot as soon as a freshman, right? And then – Frankie Tinelau looked incredible in the Polynesian Bowl, right? He has developed into a guy that could play earlier than everybody thought. You bring in Javion Cohen, who is arguably the best interior offensive lineman for Alabama last season. Then you bring in Matt Lee, who was a top three center in all of college football last year, forced Ja'Kai Clark out. That you know, it, it sucks to lose Ja'Kai Clark from a depth perspective, but. There was no possibility for him to start over Matt Lee. They brought, they targeted Matt Lee as a guy that they wanted to be the quarterback of this offensive line, and he's going to do just that. I think that pieces are in place. I think that they have enough offensive line developers to make this, this trenches what it needs to be. I think that they're going to bring in an offensive coordinator that's going to fix Tyler Van Dyke, and I think that they're going to bring in a receivers coach that's an actual receivers coach or make a guy like a Pop Cooney the receivers coach who has a relationship with those kids already. And he has the pedigree of developing division one talent receivers at Southridge as the offensive coordinator. I think the pieces are in place to make a huge jump in 2023. And I think that's what we're going to see. Frank with the positivity. Okay. All right. With the optimism, it's usually kind of, I, I, it, are you usually the optimist? Optimist? Am I, am I the pessimist? Hey. Hey, we got to flip roles every t- every once in a while, you know, change it up, yeah. keep things spicy. Hey, uh, I hope so, man. I hope you're right. I hope uh, Miami does make a significant jump. But for me, uh, I just don't see this this team making a significant jump. I, I do I do not see this team getting any worse, um, but I do not see them getting to, you know, nine, ten wins. But, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I really do hope I'm wrong. Uh, there now let's go through the offensive line like like you mentioned um you know who who you think starts to tackle i think we're going zion and then i honestly think francis mile go ends up starting at right tackle that's just my opinion i i think he is college ready i think the comparison of penne Sewell is perfect he is a future first round draft pick at right tackle with the potential to jump inside if needed but i think he is a generational talent Samson Okunlola, I think he's going to take a year to acclimate to that level of competition coming from, you know, Massachusetts. He didn't play an elite schedule. I think that there's going to be some – I think he's going to have to add a little bit of weight, you know, mass. In this. He, he's a freak of nature. But I think that they're probably going to want to get a little bit more size on him, right, and then, you know, let him transition after Zion, um, you know, leaves. And then I think J.B. on Cohen you – know, it could play at one of those tackle spots if needed as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me, I, I, I do think it's Javion Cohen who ends up starting and we'll see how healthy Zion is. If he is indeed healthy, then I think he definitely starts at the other tackle position. Uh, what about at guard? 
I'm going to Nez Cooper as the number one guard on this team. Ooh, okay. And Nez Cooper. Um, I'm a huge Tommy Kinsler fan, man. And and the staff has raved about him. I think he could be a surprise starter for this team. I really, I really do think that he could be a surprise starter for this team. He he was excellent uh in high school. Not against elite competition, but he's got the size. We've seen it in person. He has got only gotten better, retooled his body completely. We've seen the pictures, we've compared the pictures. We've had to change commitment graphics because he looked one way in one picture about a year ago and then looks like a completely different guy. And he's got a mentality. We've talked about it, talked to him before where he said, I'm coming in and I'm fighting. I'm going after someone's spot. Yeah, And, and, and that mentality, I think, is, is what this staff is looking for and the players that are coming in. That's where the culture change uh, is, is, is really important. And I think Tommy Kinzer is a culture change type guy. Yeah. And, and at the other spot, I think Jalen Rivers still holds down the other guard spot uh, for me. Um, so we got uh, Jalen Rivers and Inez Cooper, a guard, Zion Nelson and JVR Cohen, a tackle. And then we all pretty much think it's going to be Matt Lee at center. Yeah. Uh, running back, you know, it's, I, you know, I don't think that's something that we even really need to speak about. It's going to be a rotation of backs. Mark Fletcher, I think, is going to get some curious looks. And you're going to have Henry Parrish probably uh, going to start out as the lead back. And then Don Chaney, um, if healthy uh, and can stay healthy, uh, I think he's going to be in the rotation as well and pop in Trevante Citizen if he's fully recovered from his injury. But um, they're rolling with Tyler Van Dyke at quarterback, man. Um your thoughts just on that. Ro rolling with Tyler Van Dyke again. There were rumors that he possibly could transfer to a different school. We heard uh, maybe Notre Dame was was a possibility for him. But they're rolling with Tyler Van Dyke again. And uh, what I heard from a source is that they they had a chance to get Dante Moore. Um, and Dante Moore is a quarterback that I think besides – um, you know, I, you know, the, the guys at rivals might kill me for this, but I actually think Dante Moore and Nico can't pronounce his last name. <laughs> I am a Lavea. There you go. Uh, it, are better quarterbacks than Arch Manning, in my opinion. I mean, um, and Miami had a chance to get Dante Moore. He was really impressive at OT7. He was really impressive at the All-American game in San Antonio. Uh, Dante Moore is a kid that I saw in middle school. So he's a kid that I've been following since that time because he was at a hotbed um, uh, showcase. And he won that tournament as, as, as an eighth grader, I believe. So I've been following his career since that point. So from what I hear is that Dante Moore and Dante Moore had a relationship with Josh Gaddis uh, because he's from uh, Michigan. And, you know, Gannis was very, very familiar with Moore, and he's been recruiting him since since he was a freshman in high school. So I heard there, there was a uh, a disconnect with the quarterback's coach, uh, the former quarterback's coach in Frank Ponce, the reason why Dante Moore doesn't land in Miami. So uh, so disappointed to kind of hear that news, um, you know, from from a source that kind of assumed it, but I got confirmation of that. Um, so that is something that is disappointing, but I just kind of wanted to bring that up since I'm bringing up quarterbacks here. So you were rolling with Tyler Van Dyke. Jakari Brown is now QB two and you got Emery Williams at QB three. Uh, this and Peyton, Matocha, Peyton Matocha too. Peyton Matocha. He, well, what is he on his 15th year of eligibility? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Oh wow! So so we do have four quarterbacks, which is which is good because you know I hate to throw Emory Williams. God forbid he had to get into a game right now, into the fire. Um, how do you feel about the OC and really the new OC, whoever that may be, and really just kind of what they would need to do to develop TVD into the quarterback that we saw with Lashley. And just go back to the offensive line. I do think Javion Cohen is probably going to slide in at that guard spot if he doesn't start a tackle. So that that that's how where Kinsler would have to slot in. 
right? Is that is if Cohen jumps in at tackle. But I, I think that it's probably going to be Cohen and and uh, Inez Cooper at guard, Matt Lee at center, and then you're going to have uh, Francis Mile go at one tackle spot, and then Zion at the other. But going back to your point on, on the quarterbacks, um, I, so wait, I think, wait, wait, hold on. So you think Jalen Rivers just gets bumped out here? Absolutely, uh, you, absolutely. You think he gets jumped by Inez Cooper, basically. Absolutely, one hundred ten percent, one hundred ten percent. I Mario Cristobal. And and Alex Maribel targeted Inez Cooper as one of the building block players of this offensive line. They talked about him extensively last year. I think he was probably the best offensive line in the team last year. I think that there were a lot of issues with Jalen Rivers. I don't think he's lived up to his recruiting billing coming in. I, I know that he's a good player. He's had injury issues, very similar to Zion. Uh, and, and he, I, I'm just, I think that there's going to be some changes. I think okay. that there's going to be some changes, but uh, okay. going back to the quarterbacks, you know, some things that are going to need. Oh, I'm sorry. What were you saying? I was just saying that that's interesting. And that's an interesting story to kind of follow and watch and we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Maybe we put in a rager on that, but well, let's go. <laughs> yeah. We put a friendly bet on that, put some dinner on that, but um, you know, for the quarterback position, I think that they got to bring someone in that has a versatile scheme, right? And I think that the basis of that scheme is going to be that power that power-based spread, right? But I still think that they got to bring someone in that can be malleable to one year under Tyler, of Tyler Van Dyke. We know that the transition to the quarterback position going forward is probably going to be someone that's going to be a more mobile passer, maybe even dual threat, right? We're seeing Aaron Nolan being talked to. We're seeing the kid from California, Maluki Smith, who can run a little bit. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing Julian Sand, who's mobile. Right? Like We're seeing more athletic quarterbacks being the target of the University of Miami not so much your typical throw it you know every down guy doesn't give you a threat in the read option game so it's gonna have to be someone that comes in to try to get Miami to that 9-10 win mark even if it's just eight where Tyler Van Dyke is, is working with his strengths right where it's it's a, a rhythm passing attack not too much based on that read option game which is tough to do because the RPO game is is based around the quarterback's legs a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that the, they're just going to have to be malleable. They're going to have to be malleable, and, and they're going to have to get Tyler Van Dyke's confidence back because yeah. what he brings to the table is what he does in the field. We know he's not an exceptional leader, not because he's not a good leader. It's just he's more of a quiet, reserved player. He's not that voice of the locker room, right? Like Cam Kitchens is a voice of of the locker room. James is a guy that, that can be boisterous. I think that the Matt Lee kid is going to come in and set the tone in a lot of different ways. And J.D. on Cohen, who's part of a winning program at Alabama, right? Ray Ray Joseph, that's a personality that is going to be a leader for this team. I've heard that he's already taken, taken him and Ruben Bain have already taken the reins uh, in the recruiting for the 2024 class. They're trying to sit down, sit down with the staff and be like, this is who you guys need to be recruiting from South Florida, which is awesome to hear. Um, but overall, I think that they're just going to have to, they're going to have to work the first year with Tyler Van Dyke and then get into their scheme in 2024. Yeah, uh, I totally agree uh, with that. Um, so enough about the offense. Um, well, well, we'll continue to talk about the offense, but um, we'll talk about the future of the offense. I mean, you kind of touched on a couple of offers that went out this week. Um, so of all the offers that you've seen, uh, which, which one gets you kind of most excited um, about the future of, of potential hurricanes? A kid that, a kid that I like, and I think that he has a good mentality. And it was, it was a couple of weeks ago. It was Brandon Jacob. We just, you know, we're, we're going to have an article coming out on him. Six foot three safety. He's a kid that I think it can help at that safety spot. Um, you know, he looked good at the Battle Miami 7-on-7 seven seven tournament this weekend. Um, I, I loved his game. I, I loved his game. Another guy that I think the staff is very high on is Boo Carter. And and he's a guy that can come in and play two different positions, right? That they, they don't – they're there's, like, in-house, like, you know, not fighting, but, like, they're pushing and pulling on who's going to be able to get him if he does come at either running back or safety. He is a guy that – Played safety at a high level at this Battle Miami tournament this weekend. He's also an exceptional scat back type player on the offensive side of the ball. Can help as a receiver and a runner. 
I love Boo Carter. I think he's a football player. He's got a next level frame already. Um, and, and I think he's going to be a guy that Miami probably pushes pretty hard for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely like Boo Carter as well. Um, and uh, so some other players, What you, you know, we're actually less than a week away from National Signing Day. I mean, uh, it, it kind of loses the luster of because of the original or, or the uh, early National Signing Day. Uh, but there are still a couple of players kind of on the board uh, that Miami is indeed looking at. One being Nicholas Harbor. Nicholas Harbor, uh, the outstanding athlete out of D.C., uh, just a freak of an athlete uh, with his size and world-class speed, looking to be receiver or tight end. Miami went in home for a visit uh, last uh, night or the night before, actually, and uh, it was kind of their final uh, pitch, so to speak, before – National Signing Day. He is visiting Oregon. I think Oregon really kind of has the inside track here, uh, being that uh, they have a lot of benefits or support for him as a track athlete, which seems to be kind of up front as 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 his uh, you know top factors of, of of where he commits. But Miami still has a puncher's chance here because I think Miami has everything that Harbor needs when it comes to the medical field. He wants to be an orthopedic surgeon. Miami has, you know, one of the top schools, top, top medical schools in the country when it comes to power five programs. Uh, Miami's track program, you know, has had uh, historically players that, that played football uh, as well and, and run track on scholarship and, and then Miami is 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 a program, of course, on the rise. We've got the new facilities uh, coming in, or, or or due to be built uh, in, in a few years here. And and um, from what I hear, um, you know, Nicholas Harbor's camp has kind of spoke to uh, Miami about you know maybe potential NIL deals as well. So it, I, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if Miami somehow lands Nicholas Harbor, but it also wouldn't surprise me if he ends up going to Oregon or stays home at Maryland. Uh, stay tuned to canescounty.com for developments on that story. Other 2023 uh, possibilities are, uh, or a possibility is Jamel Howard. He is a, a defensive uh, tackle out of the Midwest, uh, Chicago uh, area. He is a uh, would would fill a, a position of need at D tackle, which is is something uh, which is a position that Miami needs to fill desperately. And I think that the best teams in, in in college football have solid defensive tackles. They could stop the run. Obviously, top defensive tackles are 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 tasked with basically stopping the run, which is something Miami you know <laughs> failed to do. Uh, for the most part in the past couple of years. So Jamel Howard, definitely a name to watch uh, as far as uh, maybe committing uh, to Miami. Wisconsin is is, a, is is the team to beat there uh, for Howard. Um, but uh, that's but it, that that's pretty much it as far as as far as players that, that we know about uh, that will be possible uh, players to, uh, commit in, for the 2023 class. Overall, the class is pretty solid, despite, you know, not getting Cormani McLean, uh, despite, you know, some players being dropped from the rankings, but you did have some some players uh, increase their stock in the rankings, like Ray Ray, Joseph shot up the rankings, Ruben Bain shot up the rankings, and also Robbie Washington also shot up the rankings. Um, so overall, uh, with this class, uh, do you think they need to add uh, more pieces and anything that you know about any other players uh, for 2023? Yeah, not hearing anything on really 2023. Uh, you know, I, I think that they're pretty solid on that group. Remember, they added a bunch of transfer portal kids that if you really combined everything, that's a top five class in the country. You know, it, it, it hurts to lose Cormani McLean, but 
They add Antoine Jackson, who won't help this year, but for the future of the program, that's one of the elite cornerback talents that we've seen out of South Florida, you know, over the last few years, right? He, he was a guy that was committed to Georgia at one point. Damari Brown, we think is, you know, and this is going to once again go against the rivals' rankings, right? Is one of the top cornerbacks in the country, regardless of state. He has proven it time and time again. We've seen him go against Jeremiah Smith and come out basically unscathed. And time and time again, he has proven that he's that guy. You've brought in Robert Stafford, who is one of the more high potential cornerbacks in the country. And then the offensive line we spoke about pretty extensively. Uh, you know, Emory Williams is a high potential quarterback, three star guy. Uh, you know that that is six foot five and and has that athletic ability that we talked about. Miami is starting to transition to. And the two backs, uh, Mark Fletcher, Chris Johnson, two elite running backs that weren't in the program prior. Um, I, I think the twenty three class is is top to bottom elite. You know, it's sitting at seven right now. I think if you add a D tackle, that just helps the depth. I like the defensive tackle group right now based on what they've added. Uh, I think the Nicholas Harbor thing for me is interesting, right? Because if you're able to pull that kid this late in the process, that shows that Mario Cristobal can really get whoever he wants. Right? Yeah. You lose Cormani McLean, but then you say, I'm going to get Nicholas Harbor, right? Cornerback ain't as much of a need right now. We need outside talent at receiver. Right. And he could be that guy. And once again, you jump into the top five. If you get a Nicholas Arbor, one of the elite athletes in all of college football. Right. He's he's a 10, 100 meter guy at six foot five, 225 pounds. It's free. Crazy. Freak. And, and, and to go back to what you were saying about Miami football players being successful in track. Chris Johnson is also going to run track for the University of Miami. This is something that Mario Cristobal has that old school Miami Hurricanes mindset where the Santana Mosses, the Roscoe Parishes, guys like that were running track at the University of Miami and were successful in track as well. And, yeah. and, and they're trying to get back to the old ways of the, of the Miami Hurricanes. And I think Nicholas Harbor can be one of those, those guys that does just that. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, so lastly, we'll talk about a little bit of the future. Uh, you had a chance uh, to uh, get some info about, you know, some future prospects visiting uh, Miami, inc uh, including Zaquan Patterson and, and Chris Ewald. Uh, we had a chance to see them at the Battle Miami 7-on-7 tournament. Uh, another seven on seven tournament coming up. It's seven on seven season, so it's almost every weekend we'll have some kind of seven seven on seven tournament happening. Last week, Battle Miami. This week, Pylon. Week after that, we'll have the football hotbed seven on seven. Uh, first off, before you get into that, I do want to just kind of note uh, note some players that I thought uh, kind of stood out to me as far as seven on sevens concerned. Uh, shout out to Lewayne Le McCoy finally getting a Miami. Offer um, for Team Raw. He was one of the top receivers uh, for that squad, as well as um, uh, another player that I liked was Ellis Robinson. And Ellis Robinson just recently made the announcement that he's going to announce uh, his uh, school that he'll be committing to on February 1st. Miami is in a good spot. Well, Ellis Robinson, that's a kid I love, great hips. Um, he just, you know, but just everything you kind of want in a corner, uh, he's, he's almost like a, maybe like, a he's, he's similar to, to a Damari Brown, to be honest, from, from what I saw, um, on, on, um, at that tournament. So, uh, excited to see what, 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 what he does. And as far as, uh, other players I liked. I mean, there there was a ton. I mean, Jeremiah Smith is is, you know, he he's a cyborg of an athlete. <laughs> you know, to 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 just say that. I mean, he uh, didn't get a lot of opportunities to really show what he could do, but he's by far and away to me the best receiver in the country. Um, so Miami's still in hot pursuit of him, although he is committed to Ohio State. Uh, Brian Hartline, he did make my list of, um, you know, potential candidates uh, for the OC job. Uh, that's something that he 
is indeed interested in Heartline. So I uh, love what I've seen from him. Um, OJ, OJ Frederick is is a uh, is out, outstanding talent at DB that I liked. Um, I think he has potential to really kind of shoot up college football boards across the country. And just off the top of my head, um, I, I really liked what I seen from Jabari Brady. I mean, the kid is just you know super young, but you know this kid has potential to be really, really special in the future. So I'm, I'm really excited to kind of see what he does, uh, not only for DefCon, but just you know for the future. Um, you know that kid is just just an absolute freak. But um, you know just um, your thoughts on 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 any seven on seven players uh, that stood out to you and um you know what you're hearing with miami with shamanad's um outstanding defensive back talents yeah so starting off with the shamanad thing rumors that there was a rift right between shamanad and miami not the case not the case we we, we you know we went on the message boards and kind of explained you know what happened with kevin smith and that franklin we, we 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 reported on that back when back when that walked out of practice uh, towards the end of the season. I, I don't think that's going to be the end all be all. I think that could affect the recruitment for Davion Gows, if that's somebody that Miami wanted to go after. But I don't think that's what's affecting it for Jeremiah Smith. And what proves that to me is Saquon Patterson, CJ Ewald, Kyle Washington visit Miami last night, right? They, they go in for, uh, you know, a visit of just those three. Mario Cristobal and Coach Kevin Steele come down from their week-long recruiting escapade that day just to come see those three guys, right? That, that And that's and that's a huge building block piece to that relationship with Shaman and Amadonna. They, they, those three kids are some of the top players in South Florida. Kyle Washington is an emerging talent who's blowing up on the recruiting trail for 2025. Speed demon slot receiver – Right, fits that mold of like the Ray Ray Josephs of the world, right? And then you have CJ Ewalds, who's committed to Michigan right now, would be kind of part of that mold of Antoine Jackson, flipping him from a national power as the number three cornerback in the country in the 2025 class. Then Zaquan Patterson, the number three safety in the country, can play free safety, can play strong safety, can make him big enough to play linebacker if you really wanted to. Just an elite athlete. We watched him dominate for, for, as a receiver at Battle Miami, you know, taking the ball off people's heads. So I, I think it's it's critical that they continue to build those relationships with those kids. And I think it proves there's really no rip. Because on, on a Thursday night, in the, you know, <laughs> they were able to get those three kids out to the University of Miami to come see Mario and sit in his office and, and, and talk to, you know, DVD and, and bring everybody out, which is it, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. People don't understand. Those are the type of kids that were going to Georgia. Those are the type of kids that are going to Michigan. Those are the type of kids that were going to Alabama. And if Mario Cristobal can keep that talent home, that's a huge thing. So any talk of that rift is is kind of unsound and, and I think premature in regards to, uh, you know, talking about that. But uh, talking about seven on seven, KJ Duff is a kid that stood yes. out for me. Yes, yes. KJ Duff, freak of nature. Six foot four, six foot five. People asking if he could play tight end. He looked like he was running like a four five forty out there. The first yeah. play in Raw's program history, he took for a forty yard touchdown where it was all yak, right? Like takes it gone. Nobody comes near him. You know he's within five yards. I think he's an elite talent coming out of New York. You know the recruiting world in New York isn't exactly South Florida, so I don't think he's got the attention he deserves. Despite coming off a thousand yard season, double digit touchdowns. In his hometown, uh, another kid that I really liked was Charles Lester. Charles yeah. Lester is a freaky talent at cornerback, and he's the number one cornerback for rivals. So it, you can redeem yourself, right? <laughs> Off the court, Monty McLean train, right? Go get Charles Lester. I think he's a Florida State lean right now, but I, his length at like six foot two, his you know short short area quickness, his patience and coverage, I love that kid. Absolutely love that kid. Spoke about Jeremiah Smith, the absolute freak of all freaks. Somebody I think is the most talented receiver to ever come out of South Florida, which I know I'm going to get a lot of – I got a lot of heat. I put it on Instagram. I got a lot of heat for that. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Better than Andre Johnson? Better than Andre Johnson. I think it's like um, him, Andre, Santana Moss. 
Like those are the type of names, Calvin Ridley, right? Those are the type of names you could talk about as the absolute greats in South Florida. Michael Irvin, you put in there as well. But um, even Tommy Streeter, even Tommy um, Streeter was a great receiver at Northwestern too. Yeah, but. I mean Tommy Streeter, yeah, was great, but I don't think you can compare him with with the other ones that you just named. But yeah, that's that's that that's big praise, man. Big praise, Michael Irvin, Andre Johnson, Santana Moss. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I'm not saying I don't agree with no you. Weak, he's got no weaknesses. He's got no weaknesses. He's six no foot four. He looks like he's ready to go right now. The first round draft pick in the NFL. He, he's running a four four elite ball skills. He can run the route tree. We watched him make a one handed back shoulder diving catch in the end zone at Battle of Miami. Exceptional player. Uh, and then another guy that I like for DEFCON is Kamari Williams who is also a six foot four receiver, 2025 kid. He looks like he's running about a four five forty as well. Had 900 yards and 11 touchdowns for Atlantic this season. He is, he is another guy that is picking up steam and recruiting. And I think that he's going to be a guy that Miami evaluates going forward along with Kyle Washington. It's, he's going to be a guy that people talk about over the next couple of years as one of the best players in South Florida. He was a complete unknown coming into the seven on seven season, kind of lit things up in the tryout, uh, you know, a couple of weeks that, that DEF CON had. And, and he's someone that I have just watched and, and been kind of like, that is, that's what you need at outside receiver <laughs> speed, yeah. vertical ability. We watched him be a red zone threat. The body control was there. Just power five is power five comes and, if we could be here all day talking about talent at Battle of Miami. That was, it, it's always like that. You know, we ain't even, Tucson Turf was the best team there for the weekend. We don't even, we weren't even able to really mention anybody on that team. It's just it, like even the, the teams that were in the losing, you know, part of the, of the bracket basically. Like Nashawn Montgomery is a guy that looked really good, right? Uh, Hardly Gilmore, another recent offer, former IMG receiver now at Pahokee. Uh, had a thousand yards this year. He looked really good. Uh, it, it's it was just Ricky Knight before he you know he went out to, to injury. You know, a couple of pass breakups. Really good player. Miami offered so um, in Pylon Orlando's this weekend. I'll be out there for that, trying to give you guys as much updates as I possibly can. And uh, hopefully, you know, we get some we get some more traction with the Miami Hurricanes with a lot of the top talent that is out there this weekend in Orlando. Uh, one of those kids from Tucson Turf, Jaden Robertson, he had the the basically the game ceiling interception. He played both ways against South Florida Express. Yeah, they beat South Florida Express. They beat DEFCON. I mean, they they both DEFCONs, both DEFCONs, both DEFCONs. Back to back years for Tucson Turf for them to come down in South Florida and beat the South Florida teams. Shout out to Tucson Turf. Um, so uh, one more player I wanted to mention with. South Florida Hurricane Times, Demetrius Kinchins, um, the, a player from, you know, Team Raw, again, the little brother of Cameron Kinchins, um, uh, pardon the pun, but a little raw when it comes to talent <laughs> is concerned. He definitely needs to be kind of molded into a defensive back, but the instincts are, are there. So watch out for, for the little brother of the best player on defense for the Miami Hurricanes in the next upcoming years um that's pretty much it that's gonna wrap it up for the storm tracker podcast uh once again make sure you subscribe to the website canescounty.com for exclusive information part of the rivals network also subscribe to uh this youtube channel uh at canes county also follow us on all social media platforms instagram uh twitter and Facebook until the next episode.